Leadership is a very hot topic today. Why now and why with such urgency? Leadership got us from the caves of Lascaux to the internet. It got us from Spartacus slave rebellion to the Arab Spring. It also got us from the Seven Years War to the Second Iraq War. Leadership propelled us into the cosmos and into the dark heart of matter. It gave us the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, all in the name of progress. It also brutally colonized indigenous peoples and cultures in the name of establishing a new world. Leadership gave us Auschwitz, the killing fields, Rwanda. Leaders marshal whole groups of people in the name of a greater cause, but it also sometimes corrupts them because of their power. If you're talking about someone like Gandhi, this isn't a problem. If you're talking about Hitler, it is. As Barbara Tushman says, history can be a march of folly as well as fortune. We often think of history in terms of the people who lead it or in the fictions that we create about them. Leaders show us who we are, but they also show us who we can be or ought to be. Leaders show us how to fight oppression as well as showing us how to follow. They show us how to challenge the status quo. Hopefully, they make us feel better about ourselves and about the world we live in. Leaders come in many forms. Heroes, visionaries, champions, presidents, prime ministers, scientists, mentors, teachers, bureaucrats, administrators, friends, parents, caregivers, artists. The ancient philosopher Lao Tzu said that the best leader is a sage or a wise person who has thought about how to live below the eternal realm. That is to say, he shows us how to exist as being merely mortals. Plato tells us that the ideal leader is a philosopher king, someone who is self-aware, who has rationalized the unknown on our behalf, and this is very important, is not a tyrant about doing it. That was a tough balance for someone like Elizabeth I, who had to be sovereign of the realm, but benign towards her people, and yet also had to be the most powerful woman in a man's world. Sociologist Max Weber tells us that leaders exemplify charisma. The dictionary tells us that charisma means an aura of divinely conferred talent or power that inspires devotion in others. Today, we often look at the intersection between media, technology, and business to give us our charismatic leaders. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Martha Stewart, Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg. These are what Walt Disney would call Imagineers. We also think of them as synergizers or visionaries. Whether we love them or hate them, they show us how to marshal our imagination in the name of innovation as well as the marketplace. These people are also celebrities in our current culture. And in a culture that's media saturated and socially networked, the line between leadership and celebrity gets blurred. So now we think of YouTube personalities in the same breath as Helen Keller, Nelson Mandela, Bulala Yousafzai. Uh, the cast of Jersey Shore gets better ratings than the Prime Minister. It's easy to be cynical. When Lady Gaga tells an entire generation of young people to embrace who they were born to be, the intellectual and the academic in me gets a little skeptical. But there's another part of me that also wants to get up and dance, because I think to myself, what if she's calling out to the next Shakespeare or Mozart or Picasso? What if she's calling out to the next Maria Callas or Billie Holiday? What if she's calling out to the next Alice Munro? So what about leadership in the arts and humanities? The president and CEO of the Banff Center, Jeff Melanson, uses a term in common usage nowadays, cultural entrepreneurship. He's talking about the fact that students have to forge their own paths in the current marketplace. But he isn't just talking about jobs and material success. At the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities, we want our students to be successful. We want them to innovate new ideas. But we also want them to critically reflect upon and to reimagine the things that we think we already know. We also want them to not feel failure, to deal with the times when things aren't always gonna go their way. We want them to be resilient, compassionate. We want them to be tolerant of other people's differences. Reading a play, reading a book, watching a film, learning a language, writing a poem, 
painting a painting, thinking about what other people have thought and rethought, imagined and reimagined about the world. These are the essential tools of an education and culture, the way in which we educate imaginations. We want our students to be empathic global citizens in the world, whether they're living in London, Ontario, or in Mumbai. So perhaps a leader is anyone who thinks to question his thoughts and actions in the name of listening to and understanding others. Earlier I mentioned the Enlightenment, and in 1947, after Auschwitz, the critical theorists Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer write that the fully enlightened earth radiates disaster triumphant. Before them, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, the poet Percy Shelley argues that we have more knowledge than we know what to do with, and it's threatening to bury us. But I don't think that Adorno and Horkheimer or Shelley are saying that knowledge is a bad thing. I don't think that Mulala Yousafzai would say to Iraqi women that knowledge is a bad thing. Instead, we can think of the philosopher Immanuel Kant's imperative, Sapara Aude, dare to know. We have to understand the body of knowledge that's got us to where we are, but we also have to dare to challenge that body of knowledge in order to think it otherwise and to imagine it differently for the future. That, I think, is what a university exists preeminently to do on behalf of its students. Education comes from the Latin educara, to bring up, to lead, to teach. But it also means to lead forth, to illuminate a path that we hadn't seen before. Education is a very difficult thing. It's not meant to be comfortable, but it's also meant to empower us, to inspire us, to exhilarate us, and to console us. That is to say, it shows that we're still human.